everybody, this is Hedge Pig, and this is Saturday. No, it's Tuesday, sorry. Well, you know, time isn't real when you're retired. <laughs> what can I say? This is Hedge Pig. We had a little bit of a snafu uh, when we started here, got everything ready for stream, and my mother came out and decided to make herself a snack off of the foods that we had on the table. So Andrew had to make up a second batch of some of this, so uh, yay. <laughs> okay, today we are making, according to my husband who made the display, in cod we trust chowder because he cannot resist a pun. And uh, yeah, so we're making cod chowder and this is a recipe that I absolutely adore. It's very simple, but it is very, very tasty. Um, I don't hear any music on in the background. There is music. Okay, I just can't hear it. All right, that's fine. It's a punny title. It's funny. <laughs> Laugh. It is a punny title. Yes, indeed it is. <laughs> Cod chowder. Yeah, it started out um, as a time I really, really wanted clam chowder. And I couldn't find clams for the life of me. I still can't, actually. Ooh, that's good. I have some simply, Folgers Simply Smooth Coffee, which is extra acid reduced. And I have a Irish cream creamer in it. So yum, yum, yum. All very tasty. Okay, this is, once again, as I said, a very simple recipe. It came from my clam chowder recipe, and I couldn't find clams, and I didn't want to throw together a seafood one because, which is, of course, mixed seafoods, whatever you can find, some mussels, some oysters, some squid, uh, salmon, shrimp, whatever. I wanted something simple. And so I thought, well, why not? Let's do cod. And, uh... Can we get a shout out for both Call Me Weevil and for Tina Bug, please? They are both fabulous streamers. Uh, Weevil is, of course, he just made his 60 day goal on his um, interloper stream he's doing. So, congratulations on that in the long dark. And Tina Bug is also a fabulous long dark streamer. And there's Glittered Kitten. Yay, Glittered Kitten. She is also a fabulous variety streamer who does TLD. She also has made all of my emotes and my sub badges and everything I've got that's artistic on my stream that can be made, she has made, and she was just a wonder to work with. Her prices are so good. She's reasonable in her rates, more than reasonable. Uh, what you get from her is far more than she charges you for. Uh, she is such a talented artist, and I am going to be using some of her art in a soon to be released a uh, storefront for my merchandise, Cooking with Hedge Pigs, and assorted pictures. There will be my giggling hedge pig on some things. There will also be uh, a new um, image that she is making of Pink Pig for Pink Pigs fans. And uh, I will be having cups and glasses water bottles, uh, a tote bag, both a long sleeve t-shirt and a hoodie, and I also am going to have a blanket throw with Cooking with Hedge Pigs on it, and an assortment of colors that you get to choose, except the glass, obviously that's clear glass, and uh, 
you will go to the, I will link the site and you guys can go to it and then you can purchase merchandise if you like and eventually I will be selling my cookbook on that site as well so that's some pretty good news there and without Glitter Kitten I wouldn't be able to do any of this because she helped not only by making me these beautiful emotes and images but she also uh, told me about the site. So, you know, I, I would not have been able to do all of this without her and without all of your support. So I really appreciate that. And today is my six month stream anniversary. That's right. In October 29th, I did my very first stream of a roast beef and mushroom sandwich uh, with gravy and started to tip over the tiny table I was using at the time and the whole thing almost went over and was a huge disaster but instead I just shrieked and uh, managed to save it and we went on from there and I thank you all for being there from then till now and I appreciate my new viewers as well okay so I am gonna start making this we will start with the onion. I don't have an overhead light on, but that doesn't seem to affect anything on the stream, so I can do without it. I thought we needed it for uh, stream viewing, but we don't. So we're good. Uh oh, I've apparently summoned the cook husband. 52 dancing, Honey, show on the screen. Show on the... Figgy cooking 52 heads. You smile cooking 52 heads. You love cooking 52 heads. You give me cooking 52 heads. Someone just glitter kitten resubscribed. Here is the sword that I had when I married Andrew. And it is a short sword indeed. But it is a very nice, heavy, well-balanced, dangerous sword. And he took one look at it and fell in love. What are you doing? What? Some final sign of gold is. I don't know. I'm sorry. We also live in a very noisy place, and the children are still awake because it's daylight now out there, and the playground is right across the street from us. So we have shrieks and shrieks and screams and thundering feet, and occasionally. <coughs> Some of the little deers get into their parents' cars and just start honking the horn, so I... <laughs> ping, ping! <laughs> so we have uh, a uh, rather noisy background at times, and I apologize profusely for that. La, 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 la. I am going to use the shipping box for a garbage can today. So... Call me Weevil. Oh my goodness, you just subscribed too. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You didn't have to do that, but it is deeply, deeply appreciated. Much um, welcome into the Piglo. And uh, I am going to start out by taking and skinning this sweet onion. Yeah, they're kind of small. These are not Walla Walla sweets, which are usually about three times the size. But uh, it's still a sweet onion, and um, I think it's a Mayan sweet, uh, which doesn't quite have the sweetness of a Walla Walla sweet, but I'm not going to be priggish about it and whine too much. They don't sell those singly. You have to buy a 10-pound bag of Walla Walla sweets. And they are seasonal, so they won't come out until the end of summer. Uh, in which case, I might buy a bag at that time because we use onions and everything. They're tasty. What can I say? Uh, this is going to be our dinner and our lunch and our dinner and our lunch. <laughs> I am making a, a five quart Dutch oven of this. So. I have cut this in half as I usually do. I leave the uh, root end on so that it holds the onion together and that will make it so that when I am cutting this into a nice dice 
uh, it won't go, the layers won't go everywhere. Now this may not be how a trained chef does it, but this is how my grandma did it, and that's how I do it. So, and then we just take, we make one cut here from the center to the end, and then we go to the top edge, which is nice and curved here. You have a flat end to sit down in the middle, which is a lot easier than trying to balance a whole round um, onion on a board. There's a lot of slipping and possible chopping of fingers that goes on if you do that. And then this way we have a nice even dice that doesn't go anywhere. And I'll have to get my husband to sharpen this after this show. I've been using it a lot and it's a little duller than it should be, but it works okay. So we're good now. And I go to my second and I repeat it. You take and you divide it about in half. If you want a smaller dice, you know, you can make, ouch, you can make more uh, cuts in it than that. But I don't want, I like a larger dice with the onions so they don't just melt away when you're, when you're cooking things because onions have a tendency to do that. Um, if you cook them, cook them, and cook them, they will just basically disappear into your soup. And for those of you who have a high sensitivity to onion fumes, you can get goggles that you can wear that will keep the air that has the liquefied onion in it and that will keep your eyes from stinging and burning. After cutting with a mandolin, uh, 20 pounds of onions one time with my cousin while we were making a, we didn't just make a big stock pot of French onion soup. We used a, uh, We used a uh, canning uh, kettle for a water bath canner. So this is, you know, probably 10 gallons at least that uh, we're talking about in that. Um, it was a big pot. First we started with the um, neck beef neck bones and uh, rubbed them with herbs and put them a little bit of olive oil in a big sheet pan, stuck it in the oven, and we broiled it for a while. And we got a nice good toast on the bones. There was lots of meat on it as well because these were neck bones, so they actually had the meat on them. And I'm turning this on to a medium high heat so that I can get that melting. And we took a huge We took those meat bones, we had about 10 pounds of them and we put them into the pot and we added a whole bottle of wine and we added onions and carrots and celery and lots of herbs and then we simmered that, uh, those bones all day long to get our beef broth and we then strained that. We kept the meat because it made wonderful sandwiches. Um, but we ended up, we, we put the uh, stock that we'd made into the refrigerator overnight, let the flavors deepen. Came back the next day and we used the mandolin on those 20 pounds of onions and it totally killed any sensitivity that I had to, um, to onion fumes. I, my eyes don't sting or burn or water at all anymore. And we made her house, because we did this at her house, I'm not dumb. <laughs> we did this at her house and we, the entire house smelled like onions. I don't mean just during the time we were, we were cooking them and cutting them and cooking them down for about 20 minutes to get them nice and caramelized. And um, no, her furniture smelled like onions a week later. Her, her bedding smelled like it, all the clothes in the house. We bought probably a case of um, Febreze and thoroughly Febreze everything in her house and dry cleaned things and got it. And, and we had to do that in order to um, 
in order to get it to uh, be normal and scent again. So that was an adventure. I highly recommend if you're going to do that, that you do that in a very open house with an exhaust fan. So actually, I don't recommend you, unless you're working in a kitchen, I wouldn't recommend that you uh, cut up uh, 20 pounds of onions um, at one time. That's just silly. But we did come out with gallons and gallons of the best French onion soup in the world from that. And so we're not really sorry. Uh, it is gone now, many, many years gone, but the memory still remains. It was one of the best soups that we ever made together, and it was just fabulous. So, uh, there's my long rambling discourse about cutting onions. So if you are very sensitive and you don't have goggles, you know, open up your house a little bit and uh, get a fan out to blow the air out of your uh, kitchen when you're doing this. So that will help keep your eyes from burning and running and just in general being an unpleasant experience. So we had one sweet onion I am now going to cut up in a dice. Um, fairly small dice actually, uh, three stalks of celery. And unlike uh, the last couple times I've streamed, I actually have the recipe already up in my stream recipes on my Discord. So feel free to take a look at that. I've also got the recipes up for last stream and all of their photos so you can relive the stream and you can look at the mouth-watering pictures and consider whether you want to make that. I highly, highly recommend both of those recipes. Uh, you love crying while cutting. <laughs> well, they always did say if you're going to be a chef, you're kind of a bit of a masochist. It's a long and kind of thankless job. Um, all of it done on your feet, unless you're in your own private home. So that is a... testimony to how much the people who are cooks and chefs love food and love cooking for people or they wouldn't do it. It's long hard hours on your feet and kills your back, kills your feet, kills your legs, you cut your hands up, you burn yourself and um, it's decent pay but you're never going to be a rich person doing it unless you are the one who owns the restaurant. So. There's that to consider as well, but if you love it and it's your passion, go for it. I think I need to catch up with what's going on in chat because people are actually talking. Slicing down this, and I will take a moment to dial that chat and see what's going on. Uh, let's see, bot bro, great. <sighs> she did things beforehand. It's amazing. Oh well, I like to be amazing. So, uh, this is, I wish I was faster at this, but I'm just not. I'm trying to get the dice all the same size because not only is it more, uh, it makes a nice appearance in the food, but more importantly, if everything you cut, if all of the celery is the same size, and the onion is all the same size, the potatoes are all the same size, oh, I think I need to stir this around. It's making a hissing noise at me. So I am going to stir that because I don't want it to burn. I'm actually going to add a little bit of oil to this to make sure the butter doesn't burn. 
And that was a tablespoon of butter I added and about a teaspoon of oil. And I'm going to lower the heat down to medium on that because I don't want it to get too excited before I get all of the celery in here. I'm moving a little slow today, unfortunately. Uh, yesterday was a very uh, strange day for me. Um, car rides are not a happy thing for me anymore. And, uh, uh, I was in the car about four hours, so I was very hard on the joints. So I'm a little sore today. I had been originally hoping on making this and making shrimp fettuccine alfredo, but uh, I've got to do two things. And I don't think Andrew is either, really. He's had a very exciting couple days as well. And for those of us, uh, those of you who have wondered, after we made that first pie on the last stream, we still had a whole second one. We cooked that last night in the oven, and we had that for dinner last night, and it was so yummy. That is, a, that is seriously a good recipe. I might tweak it a little bit by using a sauce next time. Um, it should just coat the vegetables and meat instead of being a profound layer like I had. I got a little happy with the sauce, but it tasted good, so that's the important thing. And I don't do it by the patented chef claw. I just make sure that I have my fingers about an inch away from the blade when I'm cutting things. So I've got some steam coming up from my onions and celery. And they're sweating down already, which is what they call it. And the onions and celery go from being raw and very, very crunchy to being translucent and soft is what you want to do because you don't really want to have crunchy onions and celery in your soup. Not this soup, at least this soup is nice and soft and filled with tender vegetables and nice chunks of cod. And uh, if you ask why cod, um, cod is a, a really good fish for cooking uh, in soups and just about any other way you can think of cooking. It uh, is a firm fleshed fish and it, there we go, there's the rest of that. Uh, it is a firm fleshed fish, it flakes easily when you're done, but it stands up really well to soups, to being fried, to being baked, to being boiled, uh, poached. It's just a really lovely uh, fish that takes on some really nice flavors. Um, it's kind of a delicate flavor, unlike um, salmon and uh, some other the fishes that have a lot more assertive of a flavor. Um, so you don't really want to overwhelm it with a lot of things like a heavy dose of onion, which is part of why I started cooking with sweet onions when I started making stews and uh, especially when I got into the fish chowders and the seafood chowders and um, anything I combined with seafood, I think it's just really too delicate of um, a flavor that you can so easily overwhelm with a really assertive onion or too much garlic. Yeah, I am just, I am just uh, sweating the onions. Um, I'm not going to brown them at all. Um, I'm not going to add any caramelization on them. These onions, being a sweet onion, already have kind of a half caramelized flavor because they are sweet already. Um, so I don't really need to go that extra step. But uh, that is what I am going to be doing with that. The next thing I've got going, I decided to make it pretty when I saw them, I decided to get rainbow baby carrots. And what is the difference between a rainbow carrot and a regular carrot? Um, color. There's no difference in flavor. If you closed your eyes, you wouldn't know these were any different. Um, but 
They come in orange and white and this lovely maroon color that's really nice. And they keep the color and uh, it makes your food pretty. So, yeah, that's what we do. And these I just want to take and make about half a cup of little coins. So I am going to take and make these not too thick because they're only going to cook about 20-30 minutes in the soup and I want them to be able to be tender. Uh, I do want them to resist the teeth just a little bit, but not a lot. These should not be mushy, but I don't want them crunchy. So we find the middle ground. And they are maroon all the way through except the very center where the vein goes up in the middle and takes the water from the roots and puts it all through the plant and up to the bones. And it just makes for a pretty little um, display. And I use baby carrots for the sweetness uh, rather than a mature carrot. You can also use those mature carrots and if you'd like to. Go right ahead. Um, I like the baby carrots also because they're already peeled for me. So, laziness. Yay! <laughs> okay, so, now to make this a, and this is a pet peeve of mine. I grew up in the Seattle area and around San Francisco and around Honolulu. And I grew up in a seafood port pretty much most of my life and um, until my later life when I started traveling for work. And the thing that irritated me most was when chefs use uh, chicken stock in their seafood. Because when you use chicken stock, it tastes like chicken. There's a surprise. It tastes like chicken. So if you're using a seafood um, soup that has, you know, it just has the broth in it, and you cook the fish in it, the fish is going to taste a little like chicken, and the stock is going to taste like chicken and a little bit of fish. And when you uh, add it to a chowder so that you are putting the white sauce in it to thicken it, um, what you've got is a yellow stock at that point, and you make it a kind of golden colored soup. And the reason why is because that's chicken stock. Chicken stock is yellow. And more than that, chicken stock tastes like chicken no matter what you do with it, and you end up having cream of chicken soup with fish in it. Um, not something I'm real tolerant of. It just tastes wrong. So, I have actually worked in a restaurant before at a hotel, the Red Lion, and I had some lovely discussions, call them discussions, they were actually arguments, with the head chef when he, everybody was saying, oh, you're from the coast, you'll absolutely love this, we're having clam chowder today. And so I came into the employee's room, we got free food. And they had a huge kettle of this, we'll call it clam chowder. They had clam chowder in there, and I tasted it, and it tasted to me like cream of chicken soup with little squishy things in it that I wasn't really sure what they were. And I found out that he used a giant can of diced clams instead of fresh clams, and he used, um, chicken stock and it was just it was probably the nicest uh, cream of chicken soup with clams I've ever had <laughs> but it was not clam chowder so I had some lovely arguments with him about that and uh, don't regret it for a minute he told me I didn't know what I was doing and I told him he'd obviously never been to the coast. So this is probably half to three quarters of a cup of these uh, carrot coins that I'm going to add in here now. 
and I have a little too many carrots, so I'll put those back off the side. And then I am going to use as the base of my stock. I have Snow's clam juice, and it comes in eight ounce bottles only. I'm afraid. But that's okay. And the clam juice is made by cooking the clams that they that they can, um, and they're very famous for that and for their clam chowder that they make. Although they've been bought out by Bumblebee, so now it's Bumblebee clam chowder. But they make it by taking water and seasonings, and they. Uh, actually, there's very little seasonings in this. It's mostly just clams and water. Um, clam juice water with extracts of clam and salt. And that gives you a base that tastes, say it with me, like seafood. If you could find seafood stock, that's fabulous. Hey there, Tavon. Saivon. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Very welcome. Uh, welcome in. Hello, hello. And surprise. Yay! I need water. So. I know. Uh, can you turn on the overhead light? Because they don't need it, but I do. Because I can't see. All right. And under that, I'm also actually going to get out my glasses. Sorry about that. That was my phone ringing. Yes. Really should silence it during streams. I'm sure she's up by the phone. Okay. Hey, look at that. I can see. Okay. Uh, yes. Hedge pigs are not known for their fine uh, sight, so I do need to use a, a, uh, a pair of glasses or reading glasses, depending on what I'm doing. Now, these next up are the potatoes, and you want to make these a fair sized dice, or uh, I call them cubed. And I will take and I will start by quartering these. And then because they're going to go into my chowder, I am going to take and cut these halves into a quarter. These are just baking potatoes. Um, you can use Yukon Golds too. Uh, I wouldn't use um, some of the softer potatoes because they'll, when you're cooking them, they will crumble around the edges. These baking potatoes and Yukon Golds will hold an edge better so that you don't have like mushy edged potatoes, which is, they, they taste, taste fine. It's not that, it's um, that they, well, they kind of turn it into a soup with mashed potatoes in it and baked potato leaves. So I've got these cut now into about a half inch by, I'd say three quarters by the depth of this. And I am going to put this into this as well. And that was 16 ounces of clam juice. And when I get done with my potatoes, the temptation here is to add a huge ton of potatoes to this because you want to have a significant presence of potatoes in your fish chowder. And the problem is, if you do that, you if you even add another couple potatoes to this, what you'll end up with is a pot full of potatoes and no room for your fish. And the fish is the star of the day. So I am restricting myself to two potatoes because I also have a lot of vegetables in there. And I'm going to be putting in two pounds of cod. So that's quite a bit of cod. And if I mispronounced your name, Savon, uh, please let me know. I will try to correct that. And I haven't asked anybody yet, but how is everybody today? I know that uh, Weevil is having a great day. He met his, he exceeded his best uh, survival on Interloper and the Long Dark, a fabulous uh, survival game done uh, 
after basically a war possible worldwide calamity where all, there's no power and um, all technology is knocked out, cars don't work, uh, it's a big geothermal storm, and the animals basically go mad and the world goes into a really, really cold spell. It's a wonderful survival game. Uh, it has both a story and it has a sandbox where you can go in and just try to survive on your own with various settings. And I have seen um, I have seen Tina Bug around playing a new game, Call of the Wild. Don't know much about that one. Thank you, honey. And now that I've got the potatoes in here, I am going to add just enough water to make sure, and this is boiled water, I am going to add just enough water to this to make sure the potatoes are covered because this is going to be a thick chowder. So I've got that done now, and I need to raise this to a boil. And we will be cooking these potatoes to a fork tender. And that will take, at the size I cut them, probably 12 to 15 minutes once it reaches a boil. And I'm going to munch another baby carrot here. Now, my grandmother never really taught me to make any kind of um, chowder from scratch, except for the um, my grandfather's favorite um, chowder-like soup, which was oyster stew. And as they lived in eastern Washington, which is a landlocked area, and it is about... 250 to 300 miles from Seattle inland and they have limited fresh seafood. Um, it's better these days with flights and all but it really doesn't compare to your seaports where your fish markets get their fish every morning at 4 a.m. off of the fishing boats. So there's a decided uh, risk if you go to a uh, market that has seafood in eastern Washington. Um, they have a tendency to smell like rotting fish, which smells like ammonia, by the way. And it only takes a couple days to get to that point. That's not good. If you smell that, leave. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a uh, fish rundown. If you have fish, uh, you need to look at it. You ask to smell it. If you go to a, an, an area that has the seafood open that you can see and ask to smell it, look and make sure that the fish is, the flesh is glossy and moist. Uh, if it has a skin on it, if it has its skin and its scales, you need to make sure that that skin is smooth, it's not wrinkled, it's not puckered, it's not sunk in, and that once again it's wet and it's glossy. If your fish has eyes and a head and fins yet, those fins should be wet. They should be, um, they should look like you just pulled it out of the water. Um, the eyes should be bright. They should be convex. Uh, uh, and they shouldn't be cloudy. They definitely shouldn't be dry. The gills should be a nice clear red and they shouldn't be darkened and dry looking and the eyes shouldn't be sunken and cloudy. If you see any of those things, that fish is old. And if you smell it, what it will smell like is ammonia because it's basically rotting. Um, fresh fish has only the lightest of fish aromas. Um, what you smell in an ocean fish is a little bit of fish and most of what you smell is a briny sea smell like the ocean. And if you are looking at a freshwater fish, it kind of smells a little minerally, like um, water 
directly from a mountain spring. It'll have that scent to it, and it'll have a light little bit of fish. But it never hits you in the face and says, I'm fish. If you smell those smells, yeah, go somewhere else. Um, find out when they got their fish. If they can't answer that, leave. You do not want to eat bad fish. Most of the times, the people who say, I don't like fish, it's because they come from a landlocked area and they've never had good fish. So, there we go with my little two cents there. Um, let's see, I'm gonna make sure these are broken up. It's already steaming since I started with boiling water and only 16 ounces of Snow's All Natural Clam Juice. Now, if you want to make this instead of a uh, New England style type chowder, a white chowder. If you don't want to have it made with milk, if you want to make it with, uh, make like if you're making a Manhattan clam chowder, uh, that is made with a tomato and clam juice broth. And in that case, what I would suggest you buy is Clamato, which is clam juice and tomato juice and it's got some seasonings in there. It's nice and zesty. If you're going to make a, a chipino, which is a um, fish stew that they make, uh, well, I think it's from Italy. Chipino is actually an Italian. And basically, it is a seafood stew. And it is made all spicy. It's got garlic in it and peppers. And it's, it's tangy and zesty and, and, and rich, and you can make that with the Clamato. And that is probably the easiest way to get that flavor. You could make this with that red stock as well, and it would be just fine. Even if you wanted to add the white sauce to it, you'd end up with what I call a rosy white, white stock. And that's actually quite tasty, especially if you're doing this, if you were making a salmon chowder. Uh, tomatoes with the salmon is a really nice taste. Um, the sweetness goes good with it. All right, I have got this reaching a boil, so now I will give this until the top of the hour. Uh, that is about 12 more minutes to finish here. New fish soundbite coming soon. Yeah, I talk about fish a lot. Um, I do know that a lot of the country and a lot of other countries don't have really fresh fish. Um, there's other things that we have in the Washington state area that are not real common over the rest of the world. And some of that is um, we not only have just about every kind of seafood you can think of, we have salmon and we have beautiful Dungeness crab, uh, which is like a stone crab if you don't have it in your area, which is pretty much west coast. Um, on the east coast, you're looking at stone crabs, and it's similar in flavor. Um, we have uh, scallops and oysters and clams and mussels, and we have places that farm these. They have huge floats out, out in the ocean, and they have these basically perfect conditions for these different sorts of clams and different sorts of uh, shellfish to grow and they just reel them in and have beautiful water quality and wonderful clams and seafood. We have some of the few places in the world that actually have uh, growing wild um, gooey duck clams. And what gooey duck clams are is an enormous clam that's very phallic in appearance. The clam shell alone is about this big, and then the neck of the clam, which is most of what you eat, goes out of that clam shell, you know, another anywhere between eight inches to a foot, and that's when it's all retracted. And those sell for about $150 each. It is very expensive and it is a huge luxury item. And we didn't know when I was growing up, those were just good. <laughs> they were around here, they were good. We also have razor clams, which are about this big. 
and about that shape. He redeemed a pink pig, probably to shut me up about fish. So, here comes Pink Pig! It's a Pink Pig! It's a Pink Pig! She's a happy, 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 happy Pink Pig! Pink Pig! Pink Pig! Happy, 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 happy Pink Pig! Yay! <laughs> pink Pig! Yes, honey, you would do that just to shut me up. I am pontificating about seafood. Um, anyway. Uh, razor clams are about this long or longer. They're about this size. They're named that because they are the size of a straight razor. And uh, I absolutely love using those for um, clam chowder. Wonderful flavor, nice and meaty clam. Um, hard to get though. I haven't found anybody that farms those yet. I'm not sure if it's possible, but it would be awesome if it was. Okay, while this is cooking, I am now going to open my wild caught Pacific cod. And this is mild in flavor, medium texture. It's boneless and skinless. I've got two pounds of it here, individually uh, wrapped, because that's the way it comes. Uh, it helps so that it doesn't, you know, cling together. But you're looking at some fairly sizable chunks of fish here. It, they're about an inch, inch and a half thick, and probably two inches to three inches wide. And it's a nice sized portion. Um, see, this is a much bigger chunk here, and it's just, cod is just such a wonderful fish. And it's, they have fought wars over cod, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, England usually involved in it because they love their cod. Uh, Iceland absolutely adores cod too and they had three they've had three cod wars in the last 50 years so and it was the right to do the fishing for that cod um, it's just a really versatile fish and i will show you other things to do with it than put it in the soup um, i've got a lot it makes some lovely casseroles and some noodle dishes with it um, and there are several different ways to cook it. I will eventually be showing you fish and chips, the British way, as close as I can get not being a Brit. Honey, these are hard as a hard as a rock. I'm going to have to cut these out and have you nook them a little bit. I won't be able to cut them. they were frozen. Normally we get them out a little bit sooner. They aren't usually this thick. These are some really nice thick chunks. These would have made it really good uh, butter, uh, lemon and butter uh, cod, which is about as simple as you can get it. It's cod with lemon and butter. And then you poach it. And it's just, oh, it's so yummy. Make some of your own fresh Tartar sauce and cocktail sauce for it. I just yum, 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 yum. So I've got all of these free now for you, hun. here cooking away. Add a little bit more water to that because it looks like it's coming up a little short. I want to make sure the potatoes are covered so the potatoes become tender. six minutes left on what I expect this to need and um, let me see my other pan. Ah, I put it up there. All right at this point I'm going to start adding some of my seasonings to this. I have got uh, sage that I'm going to be adding to this 
and I add a... I have these lovely uh, measuring set here, and it's got two different shapes because of sometimes you get it into the small neck of a bottle. Um, they're held together neatly so that you don't lose them in your drawers. I'm going to add a quarter teaspoon of sage. I am going to add a half a teaspoon of dill to this. Dill goes really good uh, with potatoes and obviously with fish. Um, this is a, uh, it's not just a dried dill, this is a freeze dried dill, which um, it makes it taste really fresh. It preserves the flavor, it preserves the color more than just a dried thing. And that's actually from Lighthouse. I recommend this above other brands. If you can't use fresh dill, go for Lighthouse dill. And then I am going to add a teaspoon of the... Actually, I'm going to add a tablespoon of the... Um, and here you can see why it has this shape. It has a narrow shape for going through if it's narrow. It has a round shape for going through if it has enough big space. And this is actually a half tablespoon measure. So I will add two of those to get the tablespoon I'm going to add to it. And I don't try to overwhelm this with uh, the herbs. And it's easy enough to do that, so we try not to. Um, I am going to add some pepper to it. Yes, thank you so much for everybody who has uh, helped us with our subscriber goal. And I thank everybody for the follows that I'm getting. And we are going to have a celebration. This is my six month anniversary stream. And uh, so I went a little out and got the uh, cod and I made a soup I've been promising to make since December. And um, at 200 followers, I am going to give away a PDF of my cookbook, Cooking with Hedge Pigs. I am still not hearing the sound, but I'll say it for you, honey. How it is pronounced is Worcestershire sauce, and how it is pronounced in my area of America, they pronounce it Worcestershire. <laughs> and the first time I said that to them, we were in a grocery store, and I said, do you want me to get any Worcestershire sauce? And he turned around and said, Ugh, what did you say? And I said, Worcestershire sauce? Do you know what Worcestershire sauce is? And he says, no, that is, never say that again. That is pronounced Worcestershire. And these are not ready yet. I didn't think so. We're going to probably need another five minutes on that. They're almost there, but one of the bigger dices that I had, um, because of course potatoes are not perfect. Um, it's still showing a little bit too much resistance. There's still a hard white in the center, and I don't want that. Um, my measuring spoons, and my cutting boards, and my... Uh, that's hot. Don't do that. That's hot. Uh, this is my... Uh, it is a beautiful stove top. And it's different than a lot of them, uh, a lot of these hot plates, because these are um, solid cast iron plates that it heats up instead of a coil. So you don't have a changing of the, you'll have hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, and it's really not the most efficient way to heat something up if you can't use gas, if you don't have an induction uh, cooktop, 
using one of these that you know has a cast iron plate it plates it, it, it heats up hot it's a little bit slower to heat up but when it heats up it retains the heat and it's an even heat all the way across and that's really what you want um, you don't want to have variances in it so you have hot and cold spots that's also the appeal of um, part of the appeal of cast iron pots and cast iron pans that the whole surface heats up and they do just a wonderful hot dry heat I am going to turn this down a little bit in temperature now because, uh, sorry, uh, I need to get it so it's not in quite such a frantic boil. Um, as I was saying, all of the equipment that I use on stream, including my streaming equipment, is on my Discord, and I'm sure Andrew can peel up my ad for my Discord again. Uh, it is listed under stream equipment and all of my recipes are under stream recipes and we've got pictures of stream food pictures up there everything I've cooked I've got pictures of so if you need to join my discard follow that there and join the pigloo and you can see every recipe that I have cooked in the last six months pictures of them all and the recipes uh, that I have used and I invite you all to post your own recipes and um, post pictures of the food you ate that you just think was scrumptious, whether it's in a restaurant or someone else's house or, you know, something that you made yourself. We'd love to have you share that and uh, get everybody else drooling and hungry and get them to cook more. <laughs> you don't want to. Okay, Britt. Britt G. Um, well, welcome in. Thank you for saying hello. Hello to you too. Um, obviously, you don't have to join my Discord. You don't have to follow me if you don't want to. I'd like it if you did, but definitely not necessary. <laughs> yeah, going around to strangers' houses. <laughs> And uh, taking pictures of their food from the windows or whatever. A little bit weird. We don't want you to do that. Well, what can I say, Britt? I, I am a little needy and uh, a little clingy. So um, I like to think of the people in my community as my friends. They have been that way um, for long before I started streaming. And it's just a wonderful... It's just a wonderful community. As I was saying, the only soup, only seafood type thing that my grandmother ever taught me to cook, she taught me how to do pan fried trout because that was something we had in Eastern Washington. But the only other thing she taught me to make was the uh, oyster stew that my grandfather liked, and it was really simple. She had onion, celery, potatoes, and then she used jarred raw oysters and she just poured milk into it and brought it to a boil and unfortunately because she didn't wasn't used to really cooking seafood seafood was the one thing she didn't really master it tasted good but she cooked the living tar out of the oysters and they were kind of little bouncy balls instead of the soft tender um, bite that an oyster should be oysters literally if you have a simmering liquid you just put the raw oyster in and turn the heat off and stir it around and by the time you get the bowl out the oysters done um, it takes very little cooking to get oysters or um, scallops to be cooked in very little time if you have something like a bay scallop which is about this big around that takes just seconds to cook. If you have some of the ocean oysters, or pardon me, oyster scallops, the ocean scallops, pardon me, diver scallops, scallops like that, they are this big around. And these are the ones that you see on like um, Hell's Kitchen. And those take, if you're frying them in a pan, 45 seconds aside and it's done. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, 
I think some of the softer tones today is because my throat is very sore, but uh, I appreciate the compliment. Thank you very much. And I've now got my cod coming out of the up or out of the microwave here. Thank you. And this is now semi-thawed, which is good. I actually prefer cutting fish when it is semi-frozen uh, because it's easier. It doesn't move around. You can make good cuts in it. And this is going to be cut about three quarters of an inch wide. I need a bigger knife for this. Three quarters of an inch wide. And I just put my hand on the top of the blade and push down, making sure my fingers are out of the way. And I will cut that into about three quarters of an inch wide, and then I will cut it into about an inch. I want this to be in larger pieces. Now this is already filleted. It is already boneless and skinless, but you still want to take a look while you're doing this to see if you can see any bones. You definitely don't want to bite into a bone when you are uh, eating your clam chowder or your seafood chowder or whatever it's been. Bones are a very bad thing. In a fish this size, you can choke on them and the bones are sizable. They're not like the bones that you have in a uh, trout where they're kind of small and hair-like and although they're kind of choke inducing too, if you really overcook the, the, the trout, they'll kind of uh, become soft enough that you could eat them. I don't know why you would want to, but uh, I don't recommend eating bones. I recommend definitely in everything larger than a sardine, removing the bones, uh, just to be sure. So I am just going to continue dicing this meat up, and that'll make it too small. I'm going to start putting it into my soup here so that it can start cooking. It won't take long to dice these up and put them in the soup. And I can saw a little bit on this because it is frozen enough to do that. The outside of it is soft, where it's thinner, it's soft, but the major portions of this are still semi-frozen, which is good. Like I said, makes nice sharp cuts. Oh no! Andrew's coffee cup is empty, which isn't saying a lot because he has a 44 pot coffee urn in there about two feet from him, so I don't have a lot of pity. <laughs> All right. Hey. I know I should be no. a nicer person. No. It's 45. Oh, it's 45. I guess the last one was 44. In any case, it is an enormous amount of coffee that he has there, and he goes through it in about a day and a half, two days. Depends on if I help or not. <laughs> he has to be in a very giving mood to let me help. Hey, Cece, how are you doing? No, we don't, we don't have that program. What I am making today is cod chowder. So I've got some frozen Pacific cod that is wild caught here, it is not farmed. And it is in a semi-frozen state. Welcome in on my six month stream anniversary show. So I thank you all for your past follows. For any subs you may have given, I thank you too. For the um, stream goal I have up there of um, donations to improve my stream, buy me more equipment, things like that, I thank you very much for that. You don't have to donate, but you can if you feel like it. All right, this is out of the way now, and I have more than half filled my pot, and this is not anymore covered. So I need to add a little bit more liquid to this. And this broth 
and uh, seafood is going to cook for about 10 more minutes until the seafood is done. The potatoes by this time are nice and tender, the vegetables are nice and tender, and the big white chunks you see in here are the cod. So that is boneless and skinless, that's two pounds of cod. I have got my stream uh, recipes up on time for this stream, so uh, that's a change from the last couple streams. Uh, you can go to my Discord and look up stream recipes and look under cod chowder, and there it is. I will get pictures of this after it's done and put those up as well. Uh, I also have an Instagram. You can see some pictures of my food. I haven't really kept that up to date. Bad, bad, bad streamer. And I have, I will soon be having um, merchandise. Yeah, I am. Uh, I will soon be having merchandise that I offer for those who would like to have some. Um, I am going to put the lid on this to get it to come to the boil again faster. And let me see. This is needing to get out of the way. and if it's done, it the muscle uh, groups just sort of fall apart and that's called flaking. And it's a particular texture of fish that will do that. So you see it particularly in cod and in halibut. Uh, salmon will do it to a point. But there's other fish that are like uh, sole and rockfish and some other fish that are just too soft to do that. They just, they'll just kind of fall apart around your fork and um, that is because those are soft flesh fish whereas these are medium to hard. So, let me see, is the bottom of this hot? No. Alright, so I have got this here. Uh, what we need to do after the fish is done, I will then make a white sauce or a bechamel that will be very, very thick and I will put it into the seafood stock, vegetables, and fish, and stir it through, and that will finish the chowder. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of knowledge to cooking that's kind of back behind the scenes. I was taught to cook at, from year, from when I was 10 years old to when I was 18 by my paternal grandmother, who was out on the farm, and she taught me how she was taught. There were the recipes were never written down. It was just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I wanted to learn to cook so that I could cook my father's favorite dishes. And I learned that. And she taught me a lot of basic food techniques. And I fell in love with cooking foods that were my favorite foods of my family and loved ones for them. And I started reading cookbooks. My mother gave her gave me a copy of her, what she considered to be her uh, cookbook Bible. And when I was 18, and I started buying my own. I bought The Joy of Cooking, and I bought just about, I mean, I bought recipe, I bought books for Mexican cooking and Italian. I bought, I bought the Frugal Gourmets cookbook. I watched PBS um, chefs and I read their books. And I, when Food TV came around, 
I watched that and I read more things. I watched the traveling cooks and learned about food. I've spent the last 44 years learning about food, learning recipes, learning cooking techniques. And it's really fascinating. Uh, at one point, I would have become a chef if I could have. But because of my food allergies, uh, they would not allow me to enter chef school, which is sad. They, have, they have chefs now that are uh, celiac. They have those that are allergic to shellfish. You know, all of these different kinds of food allergies. I am allergic to garlic and pork. And because I'm allergic to garlic, they said, nope, we cannot possibly teach you how to cook without garlic. So I wandered away and just perfected my cooking and continued to learn by reading and watching TV and talking to other people that cooked. And, you know, it's been fun. Uh, it unfortunately gives me way too much food knowledge, but I've got a very good palate. And my grandmother's and my family's recipes and techniques live on through me. And I have written a cookbook so that they will live beyond me because I don't have any children to teach. I have my nieces and nephews, but they don't live with us. And they want to copy of my cookbook when I'm done with it. And it is in final editing. So, all right, I am going to check on this and see how we're doing. It is at a simmer. Oh, I wish you guys could smell this. It smells like seafood that is cooked. I smell a little bit of dill. I smell cooked cod. I smell the vegetables in this. The cod is not cooked yet. I can tell that just by looking at it, but it's getting there. Even just putting it into boiling water when you're doing this cooks it, even if it never comes back to a simmer. So I'm gonna turn the heat up. The highest I've got this is medium high. Um, with this particular pot, which is from Cuisinart, it is their hard anodized, um, contour uh, line of five quart Dutch oven. It has a plate underneath it that is a solid aluminum plate and once it heats up it gives a lovely even heat. And being hard anodized this is non-stick to the max. Makes for easy cleanup and it's just a wonderful line of cookware here. And it is cookware that goes from the cooktop, it can go into the oven to 500 degrees because these are metal handles here and they are riveted onto the hard anodized body and even the glass here can go up to 500 uh, degrees. I wouldn't try that, but I wouldn't cook anything at 500 degrees either. That's broiling temperature. Um, but if you're making um, cocova, or if you are making uh, beef bourguignon, or even just a pot roast in here, you can easily cook it, go from browning it on the cook's top to putting in the water and the vegetables and the seasonings and taking this and putting the whole thing in the oven and then slow cooking it in your oven for a couple hours and then bringing it out. It's just very, very versatile. And it is much more affordable than the top of the line uh, hard anodized cookware. Uh, I believe it's called Cephalon. Really good stuff. My cousin got a complete set of that for her wedding. Uh, I didn't ask for that. I asked for Cuisinart stainless steel because I thought we were going to end up being in a camping trailer for a while, which had a gas stove, a gas cooktop, and you really can't use um, you can't use a Teflon on a gas stove. At least you couldn't at the time. I don't know if they've improved it to the point where you can now. But this is uh, 
This is now the cookware that I am buying piece by piece, and uh, <coughs> it's very reasonable. It is, I would say, comparable to the Cephalon, and Cuisinart has just really nice products, whether you're talking about cookware like this, or bakeware, or their appliances. Uh, their appliances are really good, too. Okay, I have just been babbling to fill time. I am going to stir this around again. It has reached a simmer, which is good. And I suspect the fish is done. I am going to take a piece. Yes, me babbling. I've never done that, have I? I am going to take a knife and very gently insert it into here and I don't think you can see that from here but because I did it from the opposite side it flakes each of these little flakes that are here come away the fish is done so I'm gonna put this back into the pot because it doesn't really have to cook anymore. And I will move that off to the side and give the top heat to my three-quart saucepan. And I'm going to start out by adding about six tablespoons of butter or three quarters of a stick of butter to this uh, pan here. I'm going to want a black background. I'm going to shock you. <laughs> You're so good. <laughs> okay. Got that on a medium high heat, my favorite temperature. And for this, I am going to use a plastic coated whisk because you don't want to use metal in any kind of um, anti stick pan. It says you can, you really don't want to. And as this is melting, so I've got basically three quarters of a stick of butter. I am going to add to that roughly three quarters of a stick, pardon me, three quarters of a cup of flour. And this is just all purpose flour unseasoned. Yeah, and I add that in here. And you are going for a texture that is basically like wet sand. You don't want to have too much butter in it for your uh, flour. And if you are lactose intolerant, you can use margarine on this. You can use, uh, oh, I added a little too much flour in it this time. You can fix that by either adding more butter or you can add a little bit of oil to this, and this is canola oil, and I added about a tablespoon there to loosen it up. And mix this around until you have it well mixed. And I'm trying to get the bits that have gone through the wire whisk to come out. And as you see, it's a little clumpy, but not terribly. You want to make sure that the white is all gone and well incorporated. And then you want to cook this for about five minutes so that the flour is cooked. Otherwise, what you will have is a sauce that tastes like raw flour. It'll taste like uncooked bread. So we want to let that cook for a bit. Now 
Now you'll notice that one thing I did not add to this at all was salt. Um, I do a low salt diet because of my mother who has that requirement. But also with seafood, seafood is salty, especially if it's an ocean fish. It has uh, some salt flavor that comes with it naturally. And the best time to add salt to your seafood soups is when after you've added the white sauce to it and have made it chowder, at that point you taste it for salt and pepper and you can correct the seasoning at that point. Uh, you can always add more salt. You can't ever take it out and that is the easiest way other than burning your food to um, ruin your dish. So that is one thing. You can never take the seasoning out. So be hesitant with it. Make it so it's right at the edge of what you consider to be good. You shouldn't you know, make it so everybody's going to have to season their food. But you do want to make sure that uh, the majority of the people will like it just as it is. You know, serve it with salt and pepper on the table and they can adjust the, the seasoning to their individual tastes. But again, one thing you cannot do is take the salt out. So be conservative with that. The rest of your seasonings, you should be able to taste. You should be able to taste a little bit of this of the sage in there. You should be able to taste the dill. Um, you should not have a taste of something and go, salt. Ugh. Too much salt actually tastes bitter. Uh, if you've got something that is just shamefully salted, it is just bitter and unpleasant and nasty. So we try to avoid that. And another thing we do, oof, I don't have a measuring cup here, sweetheart. Uh, is we use milk that's warm. Um, when you're making a roux that you're going to put milk into, you want to make sure that the milk is at least room temperature. You don't want to put cold milk into your hot roux because it will immediately seize up and you will have clumps and clumps are unpleasant. Um, so if you use warm milk, and it doesn't have to be hot, but just take your milk, measure it into how much you need. If you have a four cup measuring and you need to have four cups of milk or three cups of milk or even two cups of milk, take and put it in the microwave for 30 seconds at a time until when you test the temperature, it's warm. Not hot, not still cold, but comfortable to your hand. If you were to stick your finger in it, you won't think cold, you won't think hot. You'll think it's about the same temperature. Then when you add that to your room, it will stay silky as long as you add it all at once. That is another thing to do. Add it all at once. And if you do it a little bit at a time, that just gives you the opportunity to uh, basically make more clumps. Now you can get the clumps out if you have a stick blender. You can use that and it will blend the clumps out and that's perfectly fine. You know, if nobody sees you do it, it's great. They'll just think you have this perfectly silky sauce and go, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> All right. I can tell by the color and the texture of this that it is time to add the milk. I guess I'm just going to pour it. So I will add what is about three cups here and I will start stirring because it's best to be able to whisk while you're pouring but if you can't just do it as soon as you can afterwards and continue reversing the direction of it because that will get any lumps out. It will uh, mix the roux into the milk. And it takes very little time to do that. Now, 
I do not, uh, at this point, season this sauce yet. I want to make sure that it is completely cooked. And I want to combine it with the soup we've got over here so that all of the seasonings and flavors of that soup will go into the white sauce and it will make it so that you have an accurate representation of what your finished product is going to taste like. <sighs> I, I'm tempted to add a little bit more. Not a lot, just a little bit. And I have done with the milk now. So now I just come forward and I continue to stir this because when you're making a white sauce, you need to keep continually stirring it so that it doesn't settle against the bottom. The first place this is going to start to thicken at is on the bottom, the heat source. And it kind of will make a little pile up on there if you don't keep stirring it, and then it will stick and it will burn. So you just continue sort of a gentle serpentine through it, make sure that you cover every inch. And it really doesn't take too long to get your white sauce thickened. And what you are looking for is for your sauce to, you'll see the appearance will change. Um, there is a real easy way if you're cooking with parsley, dried parsley, you can sprinkle some of the dried parsley in here and when it is not a sauce yet, when it's milk with some flour and butter floating in it basically, it will... <laughs> uh, the, the parsley will float on top. It'll just be floating there on top and it won't be incorporated through it. When this starts to make a sauce, the parsley goes through it. So you'll see some on top, but mostly you'll see it inside the, the sauce. So that it's a multi-level uh, type thing. It's not all just on the top floating around. Um, when I say you want this to coat the back of a spoon, when you dip the spoon in here, and I'm going to demonstrate when it's time, it will be a thick layer on the spoon, and when you strike your finger through that layer, uh, you will see that there is kind of mounded sauce on both sides, but uh, you will have a clean spot in the middle. And that is when your sauce is first available to be used as a sauce. Now, if you were going to add a white sauce, just a white sauce over fish, or you were going to take and just season it a little bit and then use it, um, you could have a thinner white sauce. Now, if you are using this, like I am, to thicken a chowder and not add gallons of milk that you're cooking to this thing, you want this to be a very thick white sauce, more like a yogurt. <laughs> Uh, liquid yogurt, yes, but you'll want it to be more of a yogurt-like consistency, and this is already turning into a sauce. I can see the differences in the patterns that it's drawing, but I don't think it's apparent to you all yet. Basically, if I take a spoon to this right now and put it in, it's kind of in lumps. It is very thinly coating the spoon, as you can see. We don't want it to be that thin. We want it to be a lot thicker because the uh, clam broth and water that's already in that is going to be um, thinning this a lot. So you want this to be really thick so that your chowder, when it's done, is also thick. Now, it's I think you can see it's starting to have a different pattern when I stir it. It's actually uh, looking like a different kind of liquid. It's looking more like a soup. You see a mass of it moving instead of this just kind of stirring things. And that's because it's getting very close to being done. This is, and you don't have to worry. As long as you have been stirring like this, scraping down the bottom, nothing's going to stick, nothing's going to burn, and you won't have ruined it, even if it gets very, very thick. And you don't want it to be that thick. What do you do? Add a little bit more milk to it. 
add a little bit of water to it to stir it up, make sure it comes back to temperature, and that'll thin it. And that's perfect, that's fine. You know, it's it's a way to save it. You don't have to think it's ruined, even if it's very, very thick, you just thin it out again, just like you would thin out any kind of gravy. I do like um, kind of calm music, so that is why that's the uh, background music. It's called Chill, actually, and I got that on Spotify, and it is a royalty-free music, so I do not run the risk of DMCA's. So as you can see, this is starting to look like thin mashed potatoes. So if I was to... <laughs> You like it, but it frightens you. Well, be brave. As you can see, this is now quite thick. And if I run my finger through it, you can see it's actually, ow, that's hot, built up. And it is. That has been built up, and it is very thick. And this is normally where I'd put it if I'm doing some sort of uh, thing. I'm going to reduce this a little bit more. Get it a little bit thicker. And this is really, really thick. I'm going to turn off the heat because at this point it's pretty much already cooked. It's already thick. And I am going to take and scoop this into my clam chowder. Or my, pardon me, my oyster chowder. This off. I will carefully move that back on. And now I take this and pour it into my soup. What will very soon be chowder. Is sitting in the middle right now like mashed potatoes but I will now stir this carefully through the chowder and the fish stock starts thinning this and the white sauce starts thickening the broth, turning it creamy and delicious. And I think you can see that's nice and creamy. I need to get the fish out of that. And now I will stir my spoon through it, getting the sauce that was on it off. And I will now taste this for seasoning. Oh, that's lovely. Needs a little bit of salt in here. I'm probably going to add maybe a quarter teaspoon. And this is uh, sea salt. around a bit. And that's done. So, honey, I need a ladle. I am going to very quickly wash off the ladle. No, the ladle's not out there. Hovering over the top of it, wanting it. I will take 
pig. My cod chowder here. Lots of cod in this. It's you can taste the dill. You can taste the sage. It's got some parsley in it, and the white sauce that I made with this was made with butter, and you can taste a kind of buttery richness to the stock that is just lovely. So I will put that on there. Ouch! And I have turned that off. I am going to add a light sprinkling of parsley to it because it's pretty. To finish it off. And have my husband take photographs of this now. And then we will taste it for you. I would serve this with a salad a mixed green salad and possibly some fresh bread, uh, like some nice uh, French bread or some crusty rolls that you've taken. Good. Yum, yum. And now I'm going to taste this here. I have got a lovely big piece of cod here. And I'm going to combine that with some carrot and celery and onion some of the broth and here is a close-up of that doesn't that look yummy and it is very hot not mush. It still has some slight resistance. The carrot was tender. You can taste the potato, the creaminess of the potato. You have the buttery milkiness of the broth we have here to make it. The flavors tomorrow will be even better, but what we have here is one finished cod chowder that is absolutely fabulous. I invite you to cook this at your first convenience. If you want to make it with a red stock instead of a milky one, you can use, as I said, substitute clamato for the clam juice and water. And I want to thank everybody here for coming today. I thank those who have done a, uh, have followed me, who have re-up their subs to me, those who sub for the first time. I appreciate all of that, and I loved having you here. I do not see any further cooks, so I am going to say, uh, looks like LD, who is a chef, is finishing up his stream. Um, you know what, let's raid Evalea. She's not a chef, but she is, however, a heck of a fine person. She's very entertaining to watch. She's a variety streamer, and right now she's doing Lost Ark. Um, she's just an amazing person and a heck of a good watch. So let's go visit Evalea, and I thank you all for coming. We'll see you next time on Saturday. And um, eat well and cook for your loved ones.